Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, sponsored by ACR Poker, where starting next weekend, Labor Day weekend, here in the good old United States, we are beginning our $50 million guaranteed OSSXL. That's the online super series XL. What makes it XL? Well, how about $50 million in guarantees, including a $215 mystery bounty with a top mystery bounty prize of $200,000. My name is Clayton Fletcher, and I'm your host here in New York City. I have not been playing poker at all this week. I missed you guys last week in the free roll. But this week, Sunday, August 27th at 6 p.m., it's the Tournament Poker Edge free roll. So you guys have to join the Discord to find out how you can enter for a chance to win your share of the $1,000 guaranteed prize, courtesy of ACR Poker. I will be among the participants myself, and we might sprinkle a little extra something on my head as a bounty, as we tend to do. But again, to find out about all of that, you need to be on the Discord, the Tournament Poker Edge Discord. All you have to do is click the link in the description of this podcast and join the Discord, join the conversation, join the fun. I hope you will. I can't wait for Sunday. I'm very excited. I'm going to be playing a bunch of stuff on ACR, including the prestigious TPE free roll. I've been looking at the uh, stats from this summer. I had a winning summer, as most of you know. Um, I have some numbers. I participated in fewer events this summer than I did in years past. I only ended up putting out 26 buy-ins which I think in 2022 I did 37 buy-ins or 35, something in that ballpark. Uh, You know, humble brag here, but I kept making day twos, or even if I didn't make day two, I was lasting really, really long in a lot of the tournaments I was playing. So I would either need a mental health day or just have to miss one of the events because I was still alive in something else. So obviously these are good problems to have, I did play three $10,000 buy-in tournaments. Uh, The main event, the uh, 10K Super Turbo Bounty, and of course, the win one drop that we've been discussing in recent episodes here on the podcast, the one with the ridiculously talented field that I was a a major underdog in, but managed to cash somehow, some way. So it was a, a mixed bag this summer. You know, I had a... A nice score making the uh, final table of the $600 PLO. Uh, I played in three $10,000 tournaments, one $2,500 tournament. That was a Venetian event called the Ultimate Bounty. And then everything else was, uh, well, there was one $2,200 mystery bounty, obviously at the win. You know I'm going to play that. I also fired once in the $3,500 win championship which uh, didn't go well (laughs) for me. But overall, a profitable summer. I cannot complain. Anytime you go out to Vegas and you play in a whole bunch of tournaments and come out ahead, you should be happy. I got off to a great start, cashing in the WSOP Mystery Millions. And then, uh, you know, right away, that PLO final table. And on the same week, I had two great shows at the Mirage with the great Jim Jeffries, So that had many of my friends and followers declaring 2023 the summer of Clayton. Well, summer's not over yet. I did well in the WSOP. One thing that was interesting, you guys know how meticulous I am about keeping track of this, that, and the other. Well, one of the categories that I like to look at every year is what I call significant coin flips. This is when I'm all in for my tournament life or when somebody else is all in for his or hers, 
and calling it costs me at least half my stack or, you know, similar situations where the outcome of the coin flip is going to significantly affect my ability to either cash in the tournament, make the final table of the tournament or win the tournament. So, uh, you know, if it's just a coin flip for like 10 or 15% of my stack where the short stack is all in, but I have plenty of chips and it doesn't really bother me one way or the other, I wouldn't count that. So the significant coin flips this summer, there were 10 of them and I won seven. Now in my career, I have won about 50% of my coin flips and I'll bet you have too. So uh, one reason why I maybe did well this summer was because I had, you know, at least that type of variance was on my side. Another thing I picked up on in reviewing everything was that my strong hands really held up in a way they haven't been in recent years. I mean, it seems like in 2022, if my opponent needed a diamond on the river, guess what? He got it. If he needed a jack on the river, he got it. It wouldn't matter. I just couldn't get any of my strong hands to hold up last summer. And you know, when you're looking at just one summer's worth of tournaments, look, I'm talking about 26 buy-ins here. And that for many of us is just a typical online Sunday. It just happens to be spread out over a six or seven week period. So every single outcome means more. But really, obviously anybody can go seven for 10 in coin flips or even zero for 10 in coin flips. All this to say, one thing I like to do in the weeks that follow the World Series of Poker is kind of decompress and then look objectively at how much of this was luck, either going my way or not going my way, how much of the variance was on my side or not on my side, did my good hands hold up? Did I happen to suck out more than usual? Like, for example, in that PLO tournament, I could literally do no wrong. I literally made so many nut flushes, nut straights, full houses, top full houses. And the best feeling in PLO is being able to say, I don't care what four cards my opponent is holding. I know for a fact I have him right now. <laughs> it's kind of rare because Omaha is a pretty wild game. But yeah, that seemed to be happening a lot. And it was pretty smooth sailing throughout my deep run. I did I did take a few bad beats, obviously, this summer. You're not going to play that many tournaments without anything bad happening. Um, one very notable bad beat that I took was on day one of the main event when I got one outered. Uh, another semi-bad beat that I took was I flopped top and bottom pair in that $3,500 win championship event. And I lost to pocket aces because the middle card paired counterfeiting my two pair. I mean, of course, variants didn't stay on my side every single tournament, every single day. What am I, Chance Corneth? I mean, I can't do that. But my good hands held up. My big pairs won small to medium pots. And I wasn't just taking bad beats left and right all up and down. And I think this is important. Even for all these years I've been playing poker, I think it's important to kind of look at that once in a while. Am I playing great or just running hot? Or am I playing terribly or just running really bad? To keep everything nice and clear in my own head, I like to keep everything logged. So I take copious notes on my phone uh, and during breaks I speak into my voice recorder. Whatever system works for you, pad and paper, if you're old school, it doesn't matter. But I do think it can be very useful in live poker to log our variants. So uh, yeah, moving on, I want to talk today about another tournament I played at the win. I actually ended up playing quite a few tournaments at the win. You guys know how I feel about the win. They are not a sponsor of this podcast. I've never received a dime from their marketing department or anything. So uh, they're not paying me to say this. I just believe in recognizing excellence and I really love the way they do things at that property. And especially on the days when my options were play something at the win or play a tournament at the, I almost said the Rio. It's going to take me a year or two to not say Rio. <laughs> I'm still in that Rio every time I'm about to mention the World Series. I should say the horseshoe, right? Do I want to play at the win or do I want to go to the horseshoe where I might have to stand in line for two hours and then sit ten handed? which is typically miserable. I mean, I did have some fun, obviously, playing at the Horseshoe, 
this summer. But from an experience standpoint, I'll take the win every time. And that's why I'm also leaning towards uh, this December. We spoke a while back on this podcast. I'm going to go on a little tangent here. But they're doing that Paradise WSOP thing in the Bahamas in December. And as much as I'd love to get out of the city and out of the cold of New York in December and enjoy some beach time in the Bahamas. At this point, I might change my mind later, but at this point I'm, I'm leaning towards spending my December in the same place as I spent much of it last year, the Wynn Resort Las Vegas. So this tournament was a $1,600 buy-in with a $1 million guarantee. At this point in the tournament, there were 280 players remaining in my starting flight and let's see 120 players would eventually be paid so we were a long way from being in the money and a long way from day two but still several hours into the event where the blinds are now 2,000 and 3,000 with a 3,000 big blind ante I think you start this tournament with 40k in chips we've run it up to 135 and the average is 117. A player in middle position who's been at my table all day opens to 7K. Again, the blinds are 2K and 3K. And he's got about 100,000 in his stack, so he's doing just fine with a stack that is slightly below average. I'm on the button with the Queen of Diamonds, Jack of Diamonds. So we've got about 45 big blinds and an M of right around 17. We've got suited Broadways on the button. He opened from third position. So middle, middle, early middle position. And we are on the button with the Queen Jack suited. I mean, if you want to fold, you can fold. You can avoid uh, being in a situation where you're dominated, like your opponent has ace jack or king queen, something like that. Uh, You know, if you flop top pair versus a hand like that, you can end up getting yourself into a lot of trouble. And there's no rule that says you have to call. I mean, you guys know I'm going to play the hand, not only because I'm discussing it on the podcast, (laughs) but also because you guys know I typically like to play a lot of hands in position, and it doesn't get better than the button. I think most of us are calling here, and that's what I want to do. But yeah, you could also mix in a three bet every now and then. You do block pocket queens, pocket jacks, obviously, also ace, queen, and ace jack. You're blocking those hands. A little bit. I'll mix a re-raise in every so often, but typically I would rather have an ace or a king in my hand with my three bet bluffs. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with building a pot when you're in position and you've got a very playable holding such as this. Now, in case you're still on the fence a little bit about what to do, let's talk about our opponent. So he's about 50 years old. He's got white hair and a Patagonia vest on, which is a bit odd because it's July in Las Vegas and it's 117 degrees outside but you know he's just got that look he looks like a guy who probably lives in Connecticut and may or may not own a boat his playing style so far has been a little bit loose but not too crazy and I've been with him for several hours I haven't really seen him do anything like a three bet bluff or a light four bet or any of those off the wall kind of strategies. So I've kind of got him down as a uh, vacationing, uh, semi-wealthy, middle-aged amateur who has played a decent amount of poker in his day. So that's kind of the read there if that affects your decision. Anyway, I decided to just call. You know, he's only got 33 big blinds. And if I three bet and he raises again, I'm not going to see the flop. So that's pretty bad news with a hand like queen jack suited. So I'd rather just avoid that issue altogether. Even though I think it's unlikely he would do that as a bluff, he might do it with a hand like pocket tens or ace king. And as a result, I'll be throwing away a hand with decent equity pretty often when I could have just called and seen the flop in position. And that's what I did. I called and then the blinds folded. So we're going to be heads up with this guy who... Looks like he probably has a credit account at Brooks Brothers. And the flop comes. King of diamonds, six of diamonds, deuce of clubs. So king, six, deuce with two diamonds. Hero 
again with the Queen of Diamonds, Jack of Diamonds. And now with 22,000 in the middle, my opponent, who has now 93,000 behind, so an SPR of around 4.3 ish, he decides to see bet for 10K into the 22K pot. Now that's a pretty large C bet by today's standards, but I don't think that this gentleman is necessarily watching the latest training videos and realizing that he needn't bet so big when he C bets. So what do you want to do here with the flush draw? Uh, we've also got a backdoor royal flush draw that bears mentioning. I think it bears mentioning that catching perfect and hitting the royal is certainly in play. All right, don't lose sight of that. So do we want to raise the $10,000 bet or a 10,000 chip bet, I should say. I'm picturing his uh, unlimited credit account at Brooks Brothers and I started thinking about the dollars all of a sudden. No, it's tournament chips. He bets 10K. Do you want to call or raise? I don't think anyone's really considering folding. I mean, look, if we call pre-flop with this hand and we flop a flush draw, we're not going to go out just for one bet on the flop, even if it is a slightly larger than average by today's standards C bet. So uh, I can see a case for raising. If we raise, we got to go with it. And sometimes we're going to be up against like ace king, pocket aces, um, the nightmare, better flush draw. That would be brutal. Um, pocket kings for three of a kind, certainly not a lot of fun. But yeah, I feel like if we, if, you know, we're just getting too committed. If he bets 10,000, of his remaining 93,000 and we raise like any reasonable raise is going to basically commit us to this pot because against so much of his shoving range we actually have decent equity so I personally am not in raise fold mode at this point so if I raise I have to go with it if he shoves uh, but what would we do if we raise and then he calls and then the turn breaks off and he checks I mean are we just planning to shove any turn card or are we planning to shut down and try to hit a flush see that's where things get a little hairy when your opponent has an SPR of between four and six let's say it's a little too big to really be happy getting all in on the flop but it's a it's also a little too small to really get away from a lot of hands in spots like this one so for all those reasons I decided to just play this one slow just call. You know, you don't have to semi-bluff every single time you flop a flush draw. And this one just felt like a spot where I could probably do more keeping things small for now in position than I could if I started raising when we're just not that deep to be going too crazy. So anyway, I just called. And now with 42,000 in the middle, the turn comes the eight of clubs. So our board is now king of diamonds. Six of diamonds, deuce of clubs, eight of clubs. King six, deuce eight, with two diamonds and two clubs. Hero with the queen of diamonds, jack of diamonds. And now our opponent once again bets on this card. He bets 15K into the 42K pot, and the action is on Hero. And before I tell you what I did, I want to just point out that I was very surprised to see my opponent bet again on the turn. I thought that he should probably be pot controlling with most of his range given his stack size and SPR concerns, if you will. In other words, what the heck does this bet mean? Like, does he have pocket aces? If he does, then he probably won't be too excited if I go all in, but I also don't expect him to fold that hand either. Does he have a king every time? I mean, it's kind of the same difference, right? If he's got top pair, he probably can't get away from it, having put in this much of his stack already. But at the same time, he shouldn't be too thrilled about getting some pushback from me in this situation. So, yeah, I thought this was an odd bet. And I thought that if he does want to bet the turn, suppose he does have a hand like Ace-King that he's just decided. He's never folding pocket aces or a monster like pocket kings or whatever. Like, he should be betting more on the turn why so small I mean, he's only betting 15 into 42 which is especially odd given his stack size i didn't really know what to make of it but i wasn't sure what was going on and i also knew that my opponent is very likely to be 
an amateur weekend warrior type. And it could just be that he doesn't know what else to do. And maybe he didn't want to give up the lead in the hand. So instead of checking to me, he just bet small. I mean, you do see players with weaker fundamentals doing this sort of thing. They're just afraid to check because they're afraid they're going to have to face a bet. They'd rather make a small bet than face a big one. And that's fine and all, but many times if you're feeling that way, it's still better to check and evaluate. Just because he checks doesn't mean I'm going to bet, right? I mean, I don't even know what I would have done had he checked. I would have based it on my read and whether I thought he was checking a strong hand or a medium strength hand or a weak one. But yeah, I mean, I don't have to bet just because he checks. Don't be afraid to check if the pot is already uncomfortably big for the strength of your hand. But anyway, he bet 15000 and I opted to just call because I wasn't sure exactly what the heck was going on here. Anyway, at that point, the pot was 72000 and the river came the tray of hearts for a final board of king, six, deuce, eight, tray with two diamonds and two clubs. So no flush came in. No straight came in either except for the unlikely 5-4. Uh, if he has 5-4, he played it in a very peculiar way, especially betting that turn when he didn't improve. Anyway, uh, it's tough to know what's going on when my opponent checks this river. I mean, I have a decision to make here. Does he have a king? And if he does have a king, can I get him off of it? Does he have a hand like pocket nines, pocket tens, pocket jacks, pocket queens? I mean, I do feel like that's a pretty big part of his range. Right, Maybe it's a little ambitious betting again on the turn with those hands. But again, if he did that just to try to keep the lead in the hand, that does sort of make sense. But then when I call again on 4th Street, he has to wonder what I'm calling with twice. Right, Even though his turn bet was pretty small, he still made one. And really, am I going to keep calling a bunch of bets without at least a pair of kings? I mean, I guess the only other hand I should be calling two bets with is a flush draw, exactly like the one I have, I suppose. But yeah, it's tough. When you play the hand in the way that he did, reading Clayton's hand becomes that much harder because he really isn't defining anything with that turn sizing. I know I can't win with queen high, but that's not really reason enough for me to bet. And my having two diamonds is actually a bit of a problem if I want to turn my hand into a bluff because I have a lot of the cards that I want my opponent to have when he missed his flush, right? So in other words, I'd love for him to have exactly what I have when I bluff the river. I'm essentially blocking my own bluff targets, right? When he has a busted flush draw and he bets and then bets and then checks, he can't really call any bets on the river. But a lot of those busted flush draws would include the queen of diamonds or the jack of diamonds. So it's unlikely that he has a busted flush draw. So if I bluff, I'm targeting hands like pocket nines, pocket tens. They just can't take the heat anymore. I obviously have a king, especially if I bet, you know, with a pretty chunky sizing, I'm representing at least a pair of kings. And I'm hoping that will convince him to fold a hand that is like a pair that's higher than second pair, but lower than top pair. And so, What's the right sizing? I mean, the pot is now 72,000 and my opponent only has 68,000 in his stack. So he's got a just under a pot size bet remaining. Well, I decided to go for uh, a sizing of 44,000. So I bet 44 into 72. I know that shoving is probably going to get the job done a lot, but I actually felt like this looked stronger and cost me less when he is getting tricky with a hand like pocket kings. I mean, look, you don't really see it that much. Typically, players on this kind of stack will just bet, bet, bet when they flop a monster. But you do see it, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. And I just didn't know if betting 68000 is going to do that much more than what betting 44000 would do. And, you know, at the end of the day, the bottom line here is that if I actually had like a 5-4 somehow, or if I had slow played a flop set myself, I would be betting an amount that I really think my opponent can call. And I do that. 
I do bet enough to give the guy a few chips behind just in case he calls and loses. So I need to do that sometimes with my bluffs. And this felt like a good spot to do that. So I bet 44000 And almost immediately, my opponent called and turned over Ace-5. So he had the Ace of Diamonds, important card there, Ace of Diamonds, Five of Spades for no pair. And he wins this very substantial pot with just Ace-High. So now reviewing the hand, I think that uh, I don't like the way my opponent played any street, even though obviously it worked out quite well for him. But yeah, I think that when you see bet on the flop, especially such a you know relatively dry flop, king, six, deuce with two diamonds, I don't think you need to bet so much. He probably could do the same thing for like six or seven thousand that he did for ten thousand. And then once I call on the turn, I think it's okay to go ahead and check fold rather than betting. 15,000 with just ace five. He has no pair and no draw at that point. So it's okay to just give up on a hand now and then. But yeah, if you are going to double barrel for whatever reason, I guess you do have the blocker, the ace of diamonds, but you actually want me to have that card when the river breaks off. So the fact that he's holding the ace of diamonds makes this bluff catch with ace five that much worse to me. I mean, you want me to have that Ace of Diamonds. You don't want to have it yourself. You want to think about the cards that you're holding and how those cards interact with your opponent's range. And in this case, I think he should have just given up. But, you know, he did. You know, give him credit. He made the hero call in the river. Maybe he looked into my eyes and read deep into my soul and just knew that Ace-5 was worth putting in two-thirds of his remaining stack. And that'll do it for this episode. Guys, I really appreciate those of you who have taken the time to rate and review the podcast. It means so much. Get in the Discord. Sign up for the TPE Discord. And then join us this Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. That's New York City time for the Tournament Poker Edge free roll. A $1,000 free roll extravaganza courtesy of ACR Poker. And for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, and with thanks as always to our sponsor, HCR Poker, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. I want to hold them like they do in Texas, please. Fold them, let them hit me, raise it, baby, stay with me. Lock in intuition, play the cards with babes to start. And after she's been hooked, I'll play the one that's on her heart. Love it, it's not rough, it isn't fun.